Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. We're here at Dubai Watch Week 2019 with a legend, collector, author, and Rolex scholar, James Dowling. James, welcome to the show. Hi, Tim. It's great. Good to be here. Thank you. Now, today, as ever, Rolex is the name in watches that transcends watches. And this is a bit of a craze that I suppose you could say defines our times in terms of watch collecting. What was it like 20 years ago in 1999? Could you describe what the Rolex collector landscape looked like two decades ago? I think I can best describe it by talking about an auction I was at at Sotheby's in New York in late 1999. I know about this auction. A, I was there, but secondly, I was clearing my shelves out a couple of weeks ago and had all these old auction catalogs there and started throwing them out. And as one does, I started flipping through and I'd marked the prices that everything had made. And I looked at one particular page, and on that page was a black 6238 pre-Daytona chronograph, two screw-down Daytona manual wind, and two non-screw-down Paul Newmans. At the end of the, the result was that the black 6238, which had an estimate of $3,000, didn't sell. Nobody was prepared to make a bid on it. The screw down non Paul Newmans made around $4,000 a piece, and the Paul Newmans made about, I think, eight and a half each. So what we're looking at is less than $30,000 if you include the watch that didn't sell and say it sold for the $3,000. So for $30,000, you could have bought what is now about a million dollars worth of watches. And at that very self-same sale, I was very proud of myself because I'd managed to buy two lovely bubble backs for the princely sum of only $12,000. And I think now, if I had those two bubble bags and I tried to sell them, I might be lucky to get eight or nine thousand dollars for the two. So, the truth is that some stuff has gone up a lot, which everybody wants to talk about. But what nobody seems to want to talk about is a lot of stuff has actually gone down. When I was, it, 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 the time we're talking about, the mid to late nineties, the most valuable relics you could buy was a steel Rolex hooded bubble back. And those were minimum of forty to $50,000. And I saw a pristine one sell at a watch show for $90,000. That watch today would probably not break 15. Okay, so quite a little bit of a dosey -si do uh, Tastes have changed. Exactly. And I think, uh, I know that n this is where everybody will disagree with me. But I genuinely believe that fashion has a huge role to play. That things, that the essence of fashion is it's ephemeral, it changes, and stuff comes in and out of fashion. And that social media has an impact. I mean, yeah. today, let's face it, as you say, fashion plays its role. I think, quite honestly, fashion is now dictated by the trends you see on Instagram, that you see on Facebook, that you see on YouTube and the watch blogs. Um, do you think the current craze for basically three models, GMT, Daytona, and Submariner, are being driven mostly by the so-called influencers and social media? Truth is, I don't know. Um, I, I see it happening, but I don't know what causes it to happen. So, frankly, yes, I think exposure is everything. But there is, without wishing to be rude, a sheep mentality that people want stuff because they can't have it. And so people rush to follow, not necessarily the influencers, but they rush to follow the people who are flaunting this stuff wherever. And certainly, the, I, I don't think you can discount the role of brand ambassadors, particularly for some of the more, not so much the Rolex brand ambassadors who are all sort of like adults, but certainly some of the smaller brands have very, for want of a better word, hip influencers, and that certainly has a lot to do with it. Not being hip, I'm clearly not one of their influencers. Yeah. But I do have a question, because I would love to be hip to the definition of vintage hmm. as it applies to Rolex. This is something that people debate 
uh, endlessly. It, it, it is, it's a moving target. I would have said 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I would have said that vintage was anything before World War II. Now the generally accepted Rolex vintage is pre-sapphire, plastic glass. But in honesty, there are people now collecting the early sapphire glass, gloss style, there are early, early sapphire glass submariners, uh, some of the very first ones with matte dials. And those are now considered to be hugely collectible and, as, uh, and are considered as vintage. The early Zenith Daytonas are considered vintage although they are obviously sapphire glass watches. So I think it, it's like saying how rich is rich. You know, you define it yourself. Well, we can agree it's a moving target. And it's a very moving target. And I don't think that any, that, there's no authority to say this is what it is. And so different people have different attitudes to it. Now we talked a little bit about how the, the bubble backs in time have sort of fallen out of favor as collector darlings. Mm. And I think it's worth kind of expanding on that discussion because vintage Rolex is a huge field, as we've described, evolving, and it's kind of marching forward with time. But there's still a lot of value. Watches that have a lot of objective interest to collectors, but not perhaps a high market value. Where do you find the value? Interesting watches that are historically important or fun to wear in the vintage Rolex sphere without spending a mint? I think. Rolex collecting is a zero-sum game, so as some, as some stuff goes up, others are left behind and relatively they're going down. So right now, plastic glass day dates are, in my humble opinion, dirt cheap. And you can find some really interesting ones, early 6611s, things of that nature. Not much money at all, but really interesting watches, nice vintage look to them, put them on a leather strap rather than the president bracelet, and it's a, a really fun watch to wear. And half the price of a Submariner for an 18 karat gold watch with some history to it. We're also talking about the, the Oyster Quartz series the yeah. other day. And I think for the rarity and the mechanical refinement, people underestimate these. Oh, can we not talk about this? Can we cut this? Because I don't want other people to know about this shit, because I've been collecting it for ages and I think it's great. I mean, I love the Oyster Court series. I own every freaking one of them, and I'm still collecting them. And I know a couple of other incredibly savvy collectors who are really pouring into those because they are, they're technically interesting, they're horologically interesting, they're design-wise interesting because they look very different from every other Rolex Oyster. And crucially, they're made in incredibly limited quantities. They're, there isn't, you know, they probably make more submariners in a month than they made oyster quartz in 25 years. Um, Especially with the day dates. Yeah, it's the red-headed stepchild of the oyster, of the Rolex oyster world. Um, so, I'm sorry you led me into this because I know it's going to come back and bite me now. Oh well, <laughs> you heard it here first, <laughs> at least you get the credit. Now in terms of some of the transitional the era, go on. <laughs> oh no, um, something like the, the Sea Dweller 666, yeah. it seems like this is a watch, it's fairly uncommon, it's a Rolex steel sports watch diver, and yet it doesn't seem to receive any respect. Is there any reason it doesn't? Is this another sort of underappreciated timepiece? It, it's heavily underappreciated, um, but the one thing I have learned in all my years of watch collecting, speaking as a really old git, is that there is absolutely no logic in this business whatsoever. It's about emotion, it's about desire, it's about the herd mentality. So I have a, a, a very early 666 myself uh, with a matte dial, uh, love the watch, but and if nobody else catches on, I frankly don't give a damn. And regarding some arbitrary distinctions people make over the years, some people are willing to pay more for Bart Simpson crowns, some people are willing to pay more for the 168000 because it was the first six digit sub. Do you believe that these things that are minimally tangible or almost intangible should be considered 
a measure of value or just a means of gauging the age of a watch? Because I sometimes feel that the Rolex aftermarket and the vintage market creates distinctions in order to create hype. I couldn't agree with you more. Over the years, I've seen the, the, the confluence of two things. One is um, obsessive study and desire to make money come together in that we have people uh, who, are, who spend inordinate amounts of time looking at the differences between bezels on submariners. And similarly, people do exactly the same with, with the dials, and similarly, people who do exactly the same with winding crowns. And they, they, have provide, they provide together an encyclopedic knowledge of Rolex. But what I find is happening is that people are taking this knowledge and monetizing it. And so saying, oh, well, this is a very special one because it's got a Mark III, it's very rare because it's got the Mark III dial, but with a kissing fours on the, on the bezel. And you never see that, particularly on with, a, with an even numbered serial number. And I just think, guys, give me a break. Um, it's a sub, love it, wear it, enjoy it. So I have a fun question about people who are maybe getting started in Rolex. For a lot of people, it's a first watch. For others, it's a, a taste that comes with maturity. I think there's that first kind of Rolex is the ultimate watch assumption as you get into the hobby. Then someone tells you Rolex is not the ultimate watch. And for a while, there's skepticism, even hatred. And then some people come back to it. So regardless of how you get into Rolex, what do you recommend? Do you recommend study first or just jump in at the first watch that catches your heart? 20 odd years ago, God, how much of my thing is starts 25 years ago or 30 years ago? Um, I wrote a piece on the progression of a Rolex owner. And people buy their first Rolex. They wear it, they love it. And they, it kind of, it, it's the entry drug to watch collecting. And they then start to read forums and stuff. And after six months or a year, They've come to believe that Rolex isn't the best watch in the world, that maybe a Jaeger LeCoultre will be, or an IWC will be better. So they trade in their date just and get themselves a JLC, IWC, maybe a Panerai. And that is, now they're further into it. Now they're really starting to study. And they start to think, you know, maybe my life won't be complete unless I have a Langer or a Grobel Fossey, but it means selling two or maybe three children to get to there. But however they do it, they, they get themselves something really serious, like a Langer. And they spend their time walking sideways so that they don't bang it into anything. And they spend, they get thrown out of meetings because people keep saying to them, are you late for something? Why do you keep looking at your watch? And finally, they realize that the watch has taken over their life. And so they go out and buy a Rolex and they wear it for the rest of their life because they don't have to worry about it. And they'll keep the Langer in a drawer for when they go to the opera or when one of their kids gets married. But in the end, for me, I have loads of watches and less than half of them are Rolex. But it, probably 80% of the time, you'll find me wearing a Rolex Deutsche Perpetual of some kind or other. Because I, I slip it on my wrist, I don't worry about it. I bought, a, I bought a watch I've been dreaming about for years, a special detent chronometer with a, one of only two pieces ever made, made by one of the world's great watchmakers. Um, and it broke. And it, now it has to go back to the watchmaker in La Chaux de Fonds, and he has to fix it and all this stuff. This, I just, this is almost 60 years old. I slap it on my wrist, I don't think about it. Very good. So, you know, that's where Rolex is for me. So it comes full circle. Yep. James, thank you so much. You're more than welcome, anytime. <laughs>